Multi-channel LoRa gateways are quite expensive and competition amongst the suppliers was not significant. This is why I was happy when RAC Wireless announced its RAC 831 concentrator board. And also my viewers. They voted for this video. Today we will build a LoRaWAN gateway which costs less than half of the first one I made one and a half years ago. Gritty YouTubers, here is the guy with the Swiss accent, with a new episode around sensors and microcontrollers. If you do not know what LoRaWAN or a LoRaWAN gateway is, you find videos in my LoRa playlist. Maybe you watch them first. A LoRaWAN gateway consists of three components. A concentrator, which is connected to an antenna and which does all the LoRa stuff. It establishes communication with the many nodes in the field. It can work on eight channels in parallel and can deal with 1000 nodes at least in parallel. A Raspberry Pi, in our case a Pi Zero W, runs all the connection stuff between the concentrator and the LoRaWAN backend. It also can be used to drive some LEDs or to measure temperature and humidity inside the gateway case and the software, which drives all the processes. Also, I use a PCB made by Charles Allard to connect the concentrator and the Raspberry. This PCB facilitates the build of such a gateway considerably and also looks much better than homemade wiring. It also has some bells and whistles. If we have all parts available, we have to plan for the connection to the internet the housing of the gateway and the power supply. For the power supply, three possibilities exist. Mains and 5 volt power supply. Power over Ethernet. In this case, you have to add the needed parts for PoE. Either you buy a PoE hat for the Raspberry or you build your own. Charles PCB has a space for a buck converter if you have to reduce the PoE voltage to 5 volts and solar power with a battery. My choice is mains and a small 5 volt power supply. For the network connection you have two possibilities, Wi-Fi and Ethernet via cable. If you want to use Wi-Fi you have to use a Pi Zero W and have a Wi-Fi network in the reach of the Raspi which by the way is not famous for its Wi-Fi antenna. If you want to use Ethernet, you either go for a standard Raspberry, which already has an Ethernet connector, or you use a USB to Ethernet connector like this one. Combining an Ethernet cable with PoE is easy. But pay attention if your gateway is outdoors. Now you have your delicate Ethernet network with all your expensive devices connected, extended to an area where lightning can occur. This is also why I use Wi-Fi. I still think that mains cables are a little more robust than a data network like Ethernet. The next decision is the housing. Here the first decision is indoors or outdoors. If you place your gateway indoors, you might use a nice case which has enough ventilation to make sure the gateway runs cool. If you go outdoors, your gateway has to be waterproof and you have to pay much more attention to the cooling of the device. Maybe you decide to close your housing completely to protect it against humidity. Then heat cannot easily escape, especially not in summer. And even worse, if you place it where the sun can shine on it, you quickly get very high temperatures. According to the specifications, the raspberries should stay below 80 degrees centigrade during operation which is not easy in hot areas and in summer. This is why I run a software which at least measures the CPU temperature and transmit it every quarter of an hour to ThinkSpeak. Charles PCB also allows connecting an I2C temperature sensor. And he designed also a smaller PCB which exactly fits into this cute box for indoor usage. If we have the planning ready, we can start. First, we have to solder all needed parts on the PCB and also solder pin headers on the RPI if you did not order one with these headers already in place. I use special pin headers which look like SMD parts 
and can be soldered to one side only. Because they are too long, I cut them to length with a small saw. The two NeoPixels will later show the status of the gateway and the button can be used to shut down the RPI without locking in. This is an excellent feature for maintenance. Also, mount the buck converter if you need one. Otherwise, you have to close the gap here. Make sure you remove this connection if you later plan to use a converter. Otherwise, you know how roasted raspberry smells. And at an I2C temperature and humidity sensor if you want. You have three different possibilities to do so. As a last step, I solder 22 AWG power cords to the board and connect the RPI and the concentrator. Now we are ready to power the newly built gateway. Of course, it does nothing. Now we need the software. Charles made not only lovely PCBs, but also a complete set of instructions and a repository to create an installation extremely easy. We can install the software for your gateway in an hour or so. You find the link to his GitHub in the description. The first step is, as usual, the preparation of a new SD card with Raspbian Stretch Lite. We use the Lite version because we do not need the graphical user interface on a gateway. You can do the initial setup of your RPI through a USB cable or via Wi-Fi. I prefer Wi-Fi, but you find the needed actions if you want to use USB also in the instructions. After burning your SD card with Etcher, you have to eject and reinsert it into your PC. You will get some error messages. Just ignore them. Windows does not like all partitions on your SD card. Open the drive of the SD card and create a file called SSH without ending and without any content in the top directory of the SD card. To enable the RPI for Wi-Fi access, you have to create a file with your Wi-Fi credentials. Its name is wpa underscore supplicant.conf also in the top directory. Enter the following text, replace your country and your credentials and save the file. Now you are ready to insert the SD card in your RPI and boot it. After a while, you should be able to connect to it using PuTTY and the address raspberry.local. As usual, the user is Pi and the password raspberry. Now you should change your password and update your Raspi to the newest versions and also install Python PSUtil. Next we add a new user called Laura GW, including password and profile. Next we have to do some configuration work in the Raspberry config. I set the time zone and enable SPI and I2C. Then we reboot with sudo reboot now. From now on, we will use LoRa GW, not anymore Pi as a user. Next, we download Charles' installation files in a setup directory and also install lock to RAM. This utility will reduce the number of physical writes to your SD card. Like that, it hopefully will live longer. In the next step, we will install Node.js. I use the instructions for the RPI0. We have to add two lines to the profile file using nano and save the file. Now you have at least to log out or better to reboot. Because we want a small NeoPixel show, we have to install the LED driver and some Python stuff. Next, we do the same for Node.js. Now comes the fun part. We can test the LEDs. And really, they work and show some colors. Now comes the important stuff. Install the packet forwarder. This piece of software communicates with the concentrator and with the TTN backend. Later, we will look at its protocol to check if everything works. This installation takes a while. Time for a coffee or to register our gateway to the Things network. This is simple and straightforward. Much more comfortable than last time I did it. Just enter all data and press save. Keep this screen open. In a few minutes, we will need some of these fields. As soon as the prompt is back on the RPI, you can start the setup. 
Here you have to enter the gateway ID and the key. You find both in your registration form. The answer to the last question is 25, the pin which is connected to the reset pin of the concentrator. Now we can reboot and watch our TTN console. In parallel we watch our new gateway. After a while the two LEDs should start to blink green and you should see your gateway status as connected. Success! From now on your gateway calls TTN every 30 seconds. In my case this did not happen and I was very disappointed. If this happens to you, you can have a look at the log file of your forwarder. Here you usually see where the problem is, at least sort of. In my case it was a little trickier. Because I had one of the early versions of Shuttle's PCBs, the pinout was not correct. This is why I had to do my own wiring and ask Charles for help. He was so kind to send me two PCBs of the newest version. Anyway, this error should not happen to you because you will get the latest version if you order now. You also find a link in the description. This by the way is the reason it took a while till this video was produced. You see, sometimes as a YouTuber I'm not only at the leading edge. Sometimes I'm even at the bleeding edge. This is where it can hurt. Anyway, the gateway consumes around 200 mA, very rarely it uses 300 mA on 5 volts, which is approximately 1 to 1.5 watt. The concentrator gets warm, especially the back of the PCB. Now we have a nice, small and working gateway. Let's do a quick test. I use my LoRa tester to send a message. I get the message from two gateways with different RSSIs because one gateway is close to the sender and the other one is on the roof. All as expected. If you remember, I put my last gateway into a tube which is cheaply available in all do-it-yourself stores. It is used for wastewater and therefore waterproof. Because the new gateway is much smaller than the old one, we can mount it in a smaller tube. I print a carrier and add this little 5 volt power supply. It is capable to source up to 3 watts. Now we can mount it close to the old gateway for testing. It performs at least as good as the IMST concentrator. Maybe this is not a perfect setup as one can interfere with the other. But anyway, in general it is sufficient to have one gateway at one place. No need for a second one. Summarized, we built a LoRaWAN gateway for around $150. It was easy because we were able to stand on the shoulders of Charles Allard who did all the heavy lifting for us. Thank you Charles. Its size is much smaller than the one based on the IMST concentrator and we were able to put it into a small and cheap tube. We could also put it into such a nice case for indoor usage. The comparison showed that both gateways perform similarly. So the RAC 831 seems to be a good choice. And, as the cherry on the cake, you can add a small OLED display. At the making of this video it was still in its early stages. I am sure it will be a nice feature, especially in this small case with a transparent top as shown on Charles' repository. And IMST reduced the price for their concentrator to 119 euro. You see, competition sometimes helps. I hope this video was useful or at least interesting for you. If true, please consider supporting the channel to secure its future existence. You find the links in the description. Thank you. Bye.